Now, on the insight side, it's something that, you know, right now doesn't necessarily have a fully fleshed out brand around it, but during Ignite, we did hear quite a bit about Context IQ. To Lead is a remote first company based out of Canada. What makes a world class Microsoft 365 internet and digital workplace? and how this turns insights into action. And we saw this in a couple different scenarios, and I was really excited about what I was seeing here. So for example, on the screen, I'm typing an email, and how many times a day am I typing an email where I'm trying to attach the right file, I'm trying to at mention the right person, and I have to always go and, you know, for example, a file, go find the file, create the link, make sure that I'm pasting the link in it all just adds up to taking a lot of time away from more productive activities. So if this is really gonna work the way they're pitching it, that it's really gonna be helpful where I start typing a file name and it gives me that, uh, that link and it gives me the right kind of link, uh, and I can also at mention people and it doesn't uh, send it to the wrong David or the wrong John, I've done that as well, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> despite my best efforts. So if that can help me there, that'll be great. And if we can even suggest meeting availability without having to open our calendar, man, I really see the kind of whole chunk of my day that I spend crafting these emails drastically getting reduced. And that's really exciting to me. So I hope that what we see here will actually be the experience that we get and that it really is helpful. We did see other scenarios as well where um, a lot of talk was made in many, t in many of the sem sessions during Ignite around better integration with Dynamics. I, I was surprised by how many times this was referred to. And one of the contexts for that was Context IQ as well, as well as Loop, where you saw that previous video I shared earlier. But in the context of Context IQ, uh, the interesting thing was being able to see, uh, being able to mention uh, objects that are actually Dynamics 365 in origin and easily having the system recognize that those are from Dynamics and providing uh, a recommendation for that as a component that I can drop into Teams. So this is obviously kind of between uh, the kind of under the umbrella of Loop but also Context IQ where it's recognizing that Alpine Ski House is a Dynamics 365 object that I might want to drop into this chat. So really interesting here. I like how they're showing these different experiences all coming together and really making our lives as collaborators a lot better. And I think one of the things that they're trying to address is this, this I think, common need that we've heard repeatedly over many years now that looking for files is such a painful thing, especially as a remote worker, when you don't have that uh, individual you can just go to in the next cubicle to ask for where that thing is, which let's face it was never efficient. But now that we don't even have that availability the same way we did, it's really become uh, not just uh, a major thing, it's become a critical thing, right? So it's really interesting to see that we're seeing more of this type of insight being proactively surfaced in different contexts to help us find that information without having to dig for it. A couple interesting assets for Context IQ here. One is around Microsoft Editor, which is kind of the, the first scenario I presented, and another around uh, kind of Dynamics 365 integration. Let's move on to Yammer uh, because Yammer continues to see investments and it continues to see innovation. And we saw a few of those at Ignite and, and a number of them right before Ignite as well. So I wanted to share a few of those. One of them is around community visibility in, in Yammer. And one of the really interesting insights I heard in one of the sessions from Microsoft was this statement that once users are able to find and become members of at least five communities in Yammer, we see a much higher retention of that user in Yammer in an engaged manner. That was really interesting to me. So that speaks to sometimes challenges you see when you do a very light or, or first pilot of Yammer and you only roll out one or two communities and you see that that engagement doesn't really stick. Um, this is something that really is something to consider, right? That maybe part of it is that you need to have that critical mass there first for a user for them to really see the value of being in that ecosystem. So think about that. And I think what Microsoft is providing here is better ways to suggest and discover communities that may be of interest. So that was previously available. It's there today in Yammer, but it's kind of buried. So the suggested communities, they're really, you know, 
pushing that up quite a bit here in terms of uh, where it's being surfaced and making that a lot more visible. And I, for one, am a big fan of that. So, you know, if I'm part of a New York community and there's also a Boston community in Yammer and, you know, I can join that and I'm curious about what's happening in Boston, make that more available to me so that I see that there's more happening in Yammer than I first thought. Another piece that I love, I absolutely adore the Q&A and Yammer. It's become something that I, you know, I would recommend to almost every organization right now. I love how they're uh, moving uh, the answer upvoting a little bit further along as well from uh, kind of the best answer which we had now to be able to collect, you know, kind of count and collect the best answers based on how many times it's been upvoted is also going to be available. So this is going to help really identify the best answer in a quantifiable way. <laughs> sometimes we need that, sometimes we don't, but this will be a, a tool like in our toolbox, right? And it will be a great way to, to get engagement. Uh, from people when we see that, you know, my vote is actually easily viewable and counted and something I can see on the screen. We also see better integration uh, coming between Yammer and Topics and Viva Topics in both ways. So in the context of Yammer, we see that Topics now, this idea of Yammer Topics being something else floating around is now going away and being replaced by the same thing as Viva topics, right? So one and one only, one to rule them all. <laughs> uh, topic, you know, topics being surfaced in Yammer here, Mark 8. And we should see that also flow across to Yammer. So in uh, kind of, or sorry, flow across to Viva as well. So on the Viva topic side, we'll also see that unified integration going that way as well. So now we see actually in the context of Viva Topics, I see Q&A that are being bubbled up here and proposing that these might be really good topics and things to be added to the Topic Center. A little bit of uh, further reading here for Yammer. There's a great video from Ignite I'd recommend you check out if you're really interested in some of these in more detail. Uh, here's the link for that one. And uh, there's also a few other uh, things in the blogs that you might be interested in, but definitely check out this video from Ignite. Now, Outlook, uh, there's a couple announcements that I wanted to share that were interesting. In the context of Outlook, they shared a new board view, which is a little bit of a new take in some ways. In some ways, it's not really that different. But really, the, the whole power of the board view, think of board here as dashboard, right? Where you have your own custom canvas, you have your own dashboard that allows you to create a view of your calendar alongside other things that you want to look at against your calendar. And sometimes that may, that may mean your tasks, it could be sticky notes, it could be files, links, goals, reminders, whatever it may be. But here we again have the idea of a custom canvas, custom to the end user, that allows that end user to really craft an experience that makes sense for them. So nothing fundamentally different here about the way we're seeing our calendar, but we're being able to put it in the context of other things more easily than we could before. Now, meeting scheduler is something I've talked about previously, so I won't kind of uh, go over this in depth again, but we did see a little bit more into the mobile experience here, which I've included down uh, at the bottom left. And I liked the experience I was seeing because it was uh, quite easy to follow. And it's definitely something that we knew needed to make sense in mobile. Otherwise, we were going to miss out on a huge chunk of the potential value of the meeting scheduler. So the meeting scheduler is essentially a Cortana-assisted um, uh, functionality or function or tool or whatever you want to call it that's going to support making uh, those meetings much easier for you so finding available times proposing those available times and also uh, making sure that things can be rescheduling taking uh, time zone into account and making sure that everyone is up to date so that's definitely something that's very interesting and really like to see kind of the mobile application getting more fleshed out now, if you're a, an old SharePoint stalwart like me, you're always digging for updates in the SharePoint space, and there were a few that were very interesting. Some of these blur the lines here between SharePoint and lists, but you know they're not really very different, right? Lists, you know, originally came from SharePoint, and now they're available as standalone, but they're also available uh, within the context of SharePoint. So I have some lists announcements here as well. One of them is a new view, uh, which is also called board view, <laughs> uh, not to be confused with the Outlook board view, but uh, it is a little bit challenging sometimes when they use the same names for different things here. But I love the idea of the board view here. It's, it's 
kind of going back to the old Kanban uh, mentality where you can create cards but easily drag them between different columns of the board to represent typically a status but you know you could use it for other things so really great experience here I love how easy it looks to be able to drag um, kind of cards from one to the other and I liked their example here of, of uh, a recruitment scenario here right where they're going through different recruitment stages with different individuals and dragging them as the statuses change Another cool announcement was support for rich text editing in the grid view in lists, which, you know, previously we could do some rich text editing, but we couldn't really do it in the grid view. You, you had to do it kind of in the editing panel. So a lot of people really like the grid view and I think uh, always want to be as much as possible on par in terms of functionality. This is really amazing to see that uh, for those uh, grid view people out there, that, that they're not going to miss out on the rich text editing. It will still be available. Another thing which I think is just a general good practice whenever we're using filters, certainly when we design uh, search-based solutions and filters are, are part of that, we always want to make sure that we're showing active filters in a very obvious way and oftentimes in many applications it's using the pills method, right? A pill uh, representing the kind of little colored box here showing me which filters I have active. So you see here I have active new application on hold and position equals project manager as active filters. So this not only quickly shows me which filters I have active, but it also allows me to individually remove one of those filters very easily. So I can remove one of them at a time or on the far right I can actually clear all the filters in one fell swoop if I choose to. Um, some other innovations around migration, uh, we saw a little bit of uh, a teaser for box migration. Now we can, we can already support uh, some box migration scenarios, but the ability to scan and assess the box environment before we migrate was not there. And so I love having the ability to do that pre-check or whatever you prefer to call this but it really helps give you some confidence that you're going to run into fewer issues and if there are some obvious glaring issues it's really a helping hand in identifying those so that you can take corrective action before you try to execute that migration. Now the support for workflow migration was really interesting. Now imagine you're in a scenario where you're migrating from on-prem, let's say SharePoint 2016, you have a bunch of workflows in place and uh, you're preparing yourself for recreating all of those manually in Power Automate. Well imagine if SharePoint could actually migrate those workflows automatically into Power Automate and map those actions for us. Of course, there's some validation you'll want to do, and that'll definitely be part of this, but I love seeing that there's at least a step towards that, because that, for organizations that had enormous volumes of those custom workflows, it was an enormous task to recreate them. So even if this starts them towards that path, and it's just a validation exercise remaining, this is still going to save people a lot of time. Now, tenant rename is, is, I think, bigger than SharePoint, but I, if you look at user voice, the ability to rename your tenant in Microsoft 365 it was one of the most requested uh, user voice items, at least, that I had seen, and it, a lot of people were very frustrated that this was lacking. So I think a lot of companies that went through mergers or acquisitions or even just rebranding, the names of your uh, Microsoft 365 or your SharePoint environment were kind of forever locked to that first name that you originally put in and could not be changed unless you were willing to completely migrate your environment, which for a lot of companies was a non-starter. So being able to do this, obviously there's a lot going on behind the scenes that needs to work for this name to be changed without breaking everything. Uh, so obviously there was complexity there that Microsoft had to sort out, but love that we're seeing at least a public preview. I think a lot of people are gonna be very, very happy about this people that have been waiting for a long time and just being, you know, every day frustrated by the fact that that name no longer represented the brand or no longer represented the larger company anymore. So this is a great, great thing that i uh, looking forward to see. Now this was one that wasn't an announcement, but uh, one uh, eagle-eyed watcher of Ignite caught this and I had to reshare it because it's one thing that I've found uh, that I've been looking for. and. There had been discussion uh, a, a while ago about this idea of automatically generating a table of contents for uh, a page in SharePoint based on uh, the, the 
the content tags that are already available. So you know when we create a text web part in SharePoint and we apply a certain certain heading style to that, we should in theory be able to use those heading styles to automatically generate a table of contents for us that's clickable and creates a bit of a navigation help for these longer, more text heavy pages. And this is kind of just almost went into an abyss somewhere and I hadn't heard anything about it for a long time and was getting worried that it had been uh, abandoned. But see here in this screenshot that maybe there is something coming and hopefully it's a table of contents web part that does exactly what I describe that allows us to drop it right on a page and even right into our page templates so that as our authors create new sections in their pages, the table of contents automatically updates itself, creating a breadcrumb trail for anyone looking at the contents of the page and needing to jump to a specific section more quickly. Now, on the syntax side, one really cool announcement was around content assembly. And in some ways, content assembly is kind of the reverse of a document understanding model, where in that context, we're actually extracting information from a document and storing it in a list. With content assembly, we're actually creating doc documents dynamically by inserting in, and filling in placeholder text in the body of a document. So imagine you have a statement of work like is being shown on the screen here, and there's some common fields that always need to be changed based on the customer and based on that specific statement of work. And imagine maybe it's through automation or maybe it's manually, but ideally through an automated workflow, you're collecting some of these key pieces of information like client name, address, uh, maybe the billing rate, for example. And that information is available in a list. And with the click of a button or even automatically, once we reach a certain stage in the process, our statement of work automatically gets created. Now that's really cool. And that's something I really uh, hope to use, hope our company can make use of going forward. Now also in the context of Syntex was an improved metadata search offering. So previously within a Syntex enabled library we could search but it was limited to five fixed fields which was of limited value. Now with the new roadmap entry we're seeing that we should soon be able to search by any metadata field available on the library via kind of this drop down experience from the search box. So I love how they've tied that into the search box through that contextual search that we've come to expect from Microsoft Search. I know a lot of people will look at this and wonder if this is something that would be ever available outside of Syntax in, in any standard library because I know a big question mark right now from people is where are we at in terms of being able to add our own custom refiners for search experiences. So this is definitely in that same vein, but definitely under the umbrella of syntax, at least as far as the announcement was framed so far. Now, a couple resources I'd suggest you consider if you're looking at lists and you're looking at uh, SharePoint very closely, there's a few great videos out there and a couple great blog posts that cover a lot of great information, including uh, what's coming as well as a lot more detail than I could get into in this short video. Here's one of the many roadmaps that were shared, this one for lists. But to be honest, if you're looking for roadmaps, I'd really encourage you check out uh, the pretty comprehensive list being maintained by Susan Hanley. Here's the link that she shared to that kind of live document that's growing as she discovers more and more of these roadmaps. And instead of uh, me trying to recreate already great work, I'll just point you right there. So definitely recommend that if you're a fan of roadmaps and really want to see where all of these products are headed in the next little while. Thanks for joining us for this Ignite recap video. A lot of information. I hope some of it was in, of interest and I really hope that we can catch you in the next video. Thank you.